I'm in love. I feel connected and happy. I can see spending the rest of our lives together. And yet, there's also a part of me that knows I could blow it all up at any moment because opening myself to this depth of love is so confronting. When I say I love you, I mean you are the cyclone in my Coney Island, the hirsute giant in my tent, my snakeskin boy. When you say I love you, you mean you place your heart on a dartboard. Let me take 10 throws. I mean I hand you a shotgun and toss my clay pigeon heart in the air. I mean hot coals and bare feet, a day at the beach, no sunscreen. You mean every time I swing the mallet, the bell clangs and I win another pink rabbit. You mean you can catch every ball thrown from any angle at any speed. When I say I love you, I mean I built you a raft out of matches and hair, lay down on it naked, and handed you the strike pad. My poem, Strike Anywhere, portrays the thrill and risk of love, how vulnerability can feel like you're turning yourself into a human dartboard and inviting someone to pierce your heart like only they can. While falling in love is a euphoric, unsustainable high during which even the sappiest love poems seem to convey the deepest truths, we all know that sustaining and deepening love over time is a more complicated and nuanced endeavor. The best love poems contain that complexity and nuance, like Pablo Neruda's love sonnet number 17 from his wildly popular book, 100 Love Sonnets, with lines like, Te amo como se aman ciertas cosas oscuras, secretamente, entre la sombra y el alma. His love sonnets have been popular for decades because they ring true and they give voice to the mysterious and the mundane, the full range of passionate long-term love. Because over time in our relationships, sentimentality and surface level platitudes just don't cut it. Reading poetry helps us navigate the tides of our relationships with less shame about the inevitable changes and more curiosity and openness. In this way, poetry turns an ending, getting mired in shame about the need for change, into an opening, being curious about the truth of our lived experience. In reality, the ending of a poem or a relationship both shuts a door and opens a window. One of our jobs in life might be to learn how to look better through the window instead of constantly banging our heads on the door. When someone's getting a divorce, I often share Jack Gilbert's poem, Failing and Flying, which begins with the lines, everyone forgets that Icarus also flew. It's the same when love comes to an end and ends with, I believe Icarus was not failing as he fell but just coming to the end of his triumph. He turns one of our most shame-inducing endings, divorce, into an opening, offering the reader the point of view that even true love could have an arc and that knowing when a specific love's triumph is coming to an end is as much to a success to be celebrated as is staying married for the rest of one's life. This poem teaches us that a marriage is a success even if it ends in divorce, because if it's coming to the end of its triumph, we have to open to a change in its form to stay connected with its truth. This is a radical stance in a world where many of us hang on to relationships long past their expiration dates because we were raised on a steady diet of till death do us part being the only ending worth aspiring to. In most poetry, nothing is that black and white. The shades of nuance it holds are a more accurate reflection of who we are and how we live. 
Reading and sharing poetry with one another can also be an antidote to the intense polarization of our current moment because we can connect directly with another's interiority through the poem. An interiority we might deeply relate to even as the surface elements of our life and the writer's life might have nothing in common. In this way, poetry turns an ending of separation into an opening of connection. President John F. Kennedy recognized the importance of poetry in personal and public life when he chose to have Robert Frost read a poem at his inauguration, the first poet to ever do so. In a 1964 article in The Atlantic, President Kennedy wrote, when power leads a man toward arrogance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the area of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses, for art establishes the basic human truths which must serve as the touchstones of our judgment. Amanda Gorman reminds us of important human truths in these lines from her recent inaugural poem, The Hill We Climb. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. Poetry reveals new ways to see ourselves and each other clearly and holistically, since we're capable of incredible empathy and kindness as well as unimaginable cruelty. What we each choose to do in the face of our complex capabilities makes all the difference in the depth of love and connection we get to have in our lives and the impact we get to make in the lives of others. We can choose through the mirror of a poem and the people we're in relationship with to encounter and get to know ourselves more fully and honestly. Without this reflection from the outside, it's hard to see ourselves clearly. Our blind spots and delusions get in the way. But bump up against a poem that moves us, or a loved one's reaction, and who we are beneath our well-curated selves gets laid bare in an instant. For this reason, we often turn to poetry to express ourselves at weddings, birthdays, funerals, and times of national tragedy, since it can be hard to find the right words to express how we feel on those momentous occasions, and a poem often gets to the heart of the matter better than prose. Reading the right poem at the right time can also be the thing that wakes us up to a new possibility for our life and relationships, one that we couldn't access before because we had our nose to the grindstone and were plodding down the well-worn path of familial and societal expectations because poetry is a made thing, which is what the word meant in ancient Greek. And a poet was defined as a maker of things. A poem invites us to slow down, to take in and feel the well-crafted images and rhythm of the words, and the way the line and stanza breaks flow down the page if we're reading instead of listening to it. What if we were to see our relationships as a made thing? Recognizing that we too are makers of things with respect to our relationships, constantly crafting them into one experience or another, whether or not we realize day to day that we have the agency to do so. We're each writing a poem with our lives, whether we know it or not. So let's craft something true and beautiful with them. We'd be so much more real with one another if we remember that we could lose it all at any moment. If we allowed ourselves to feel how deeply we want to be seen and known before we're gone. We can allow love to be both euphoric and mundane. By becoming more true to ourselves and more authentic in our relationships, we give them a chance to become more complex and real and thereby more fulfilling. Our relationships can become the place we go to experience and express our aliveness and truth, instead of being the place where our aliveness gets buried under the anvil of resentments and obligations. When we approach our relationships poetically, moments of love and joy are deepened and made sweeter by the awareness that loss could happen at any moment. 
and grief is made more bearable by remembering that joy will eventually return. Praise this beautiful, terrible world where we are opened and crushed, where the kiss comes from a mouth that bites. These lines are from my poem, The Diver. How do you hold the complexity of a world in which the part of our body we use to kiss and speak words of love is the same part of our body that tears apart our food and can cause harm by breaking someone's skin? I invite you to move through life from today forward, being more curious and welcoming of complexity so that when you meet someone abrasive or different or someone who behaves in a way that's not aligned with how you behave, Instead of coming to a snap judgment and ending about them, you can, like a poet, choose to turn that ending into an opening. We can learn from poetry how to meet a complex world, complex individuals, and complex emotions with depth, imagination, and curiosity, which will transform how we relate to one another for the better.